Hello and welcome to our introductory quick start tutorial for V-Ray Next for 3ds Max. In this video, we will go over the basics of using V-Ray in 3ds Max and how to get productive right away. We will introduce you to the V-Ray interface as well as how to quickly get started rendering with your scene. To begin, let's head over into 3ds Max. I will be working in 3ds Max 2019, but you can use earlier or newer versions of 3ds Max as well. Okay. I've opened up the project called Introduction Start, which you can download in the description of this tutorial. When V-Ray for 3ds Max is installed, you'll notice that it adds a new toolbar to the interface. By default, this toolbar is docked vertically to the left of the 3ds Max viewport window. It is separated into seven sections, providing you with an easy shortcut to some of the most commonly used V-Ray components. On top of the toolbar are different rendering related options. Then below that, we have the V-Ray Light Lister, and then the Camera section below. Next, we have shortcuts to the different types of V-Ray lights you can use, followed by the specific V-Ray Dynamic Geometries to choose from. Lastly, we have the V-Ray Material Utilities and Registration and Help button, which takes you to the V-Ray Documentation site. Okay, now that we've gone over a quick tour of the toolbar, let's click on the V-Ray Render Settings shortcut to review some of the rendering options we have with V-Ray. When you open the render settings for the first time, you will be prompted to set V-Ray as your default render engine. Let's select Yes to continue, and you'll see that the 3ds Max render setup window opens up. If we switch over to the V-Ray tab, you'll see that we have here all the essential settings for rendering. However, these settings are specific to rendering only on the CPU. If you'd like to switch to GPU rendering, you'll need to switch the render engine by going up to the Renderer drop-down list. Here you will see the two V-Ray render options, V-Ray Next for CPU rendering and V-Ray GPU Next for GPU rendering. V-Ray Next is the original full feature render engine, while V-Ray GPU is our newer render engine that renders using GPU hardware acceleration. Keep in mind that there are some differences between the two engines. A best practice when you start a project is to decide on which one you want to use first based on which engine is best suited for your hardware. Note that V-Ray GPU Next also works with CPU hardware and can utilize both CPU and GPU devices with the hybrid rendering mode. In my case, since I have a powerful GPU on hand, I'm going to switch to the V-Ray GPU Next renderer. Once again, let's switch to the V-Ray tab. Here you'll see that the settings are similar but slightly different on V-Ray GPU Next. Now that we've selected a V-Ray render engine, we can press the render button and start rendering the scene with V-Ray or we can press the Start IPR button to start the V-Ray Interactive Production Rendering Mode. The IPR mode is a specific render mode that allows you to interact and make changes to your scene while rendering, and the changes will be rendered automatically. Both V-Ray Next and V-Ray Next GPU can use IPR, and you can also start an interactive render from the V-Ray Frame Buffer, or VFB for short. Let's close the render settings and open up the VFB, which is the render display window for V-Ray renderings that includes a number of V-Ray specific features we'll discuss in more detail in a bit. For now, let's go ahead and start the IPR by clicking on the little teapot with the green arrow at the bottom right and see what we've got in our scene here so far. We can tell it's rendering because of the progress bar at the bottom, which shows the progress of the render. However, you can see that everything is dark and we're not seeing anything in the VFB. This is because we don't have any lights in our scene yet. To add some light, let's go to the V-Ray toolbar and select the V-Ray Sun. The V-Ray Sun gizmo consists of two parts, the sunlight source and a target. In the viewport, let's click and drag to place the sun source and draw out its target direction in our scene. Next, we will be prompted if we want to add a V-Ray sky map in the environment slot. Let's choose yes, since the V-Ray sky map will automatically change in accordance with the sun's position. This creates a very easy setup that enables us to try out a variety of natural looking sunlight scenarios simply by moving the sun's position around. Now, you'll see that the VFB immediately updates to display the sunlight. Let's go ahead and tweak the position of the sun by bringing it up above the ground level a bit on the Z axis. As we move the sun higher, you'll see in the VFB preview that our image quickly becomes overexposed. This is because we haven't set up a camera in our scene yet to adapt to the sun's exposure value. To create a camera from our current perspective, let's move the VFB over and then select this perspective I have already arranged in advance in the viewport on the right. 
Then click on the V-Ray Physical Camera shortcut and a camera will be created and applied to the perspective's position. You'll also notice that the exposure in the VFB has automatically updated as the render is now taking into account the physical camera's exposure settings. If you'd like to tweak the exposure further, you can head to the camera settings in the Modify tab, where you'll find controls that emulate those of a real-life camera. These include the film speed or ISO, the F number, shutter speed, and many other options. All right, you may have noticed that many of the objects in our render have a generic gray material applied to them. To create some new materials, let's open up the Material Editor and then maximize the viewport view by pressing Alt-W in 3ds Max and explore how to create and apply V-Ray materials to our scene. Creating new materials in V-Ray is easy. Simply right-click on the Material Editor's canvas, and in the Materials menu, you will see a V-Ray section which contains all of V-Ray's material types. Also, if you go to the Maps menu, you will find a V-Ray section there, too, with maps that only work with V-Ray materials. Okay, as you can see here, we already have three V-Ray materials I have prepared in advance to use in our scene. Let's go ahead and apply each of them by simply dragging their outputs to the corresponding objects in the scene. Now, you can see as the render updates that our image is quickly becoming much more realistic looking with the added materials. And we get an updated preview right away thanks to the IPR mode. All right, now let's explore how we can do a final production render. Close the material editor, press stop to stop the IPR, and exit the VFB. And then let's open the render settings once again. First, in the Common tab, let's increase the resolution of our final render by adjusting the output size. I'm going to set it to 1440 by 1080, but you can feel free to use a different resolution if you'd like. From the V-Ray tab, let's also change the sampler mode from Progressive to Bucket mode. So far, we've seen progressive sampling when using the IPR mode. It generates a preview of the whole image as it renders and cleans up the noise, which is useful when you need interactivity. It also gives you control over stopping the render early if you are okay with the result. For a final production render, however, bucket sampling is generally advantageous as less data is kept in memory, especially when working with render elements. In addition, buckets can also cut down on network traffic for distributed rendering and reduce the risk of losing information if a server goes offline. Another setting you can tweak to improve the quality of your render is the noise threshold. When rendering, V-Ray will continuously clean up the noise in the image over time so that the image becomes clearer. The noise threshold determines if a pixel needs more samples. The lower the threshold, the less noisy and higher quality the final image will appear, but the longer it will take to render. Since I prefer getting a faster render result than achieving the highest possible quality, we can add a V-Ray Denoiser Render Element in the Render Elements tab. The denoiser will smoothen out the image and give us a clean-looking render result faster. Denoising is generally a fast operation, which makes it useful for getting rid of noise when you don't want to touch the noise threshold number. Note that the V-Ray Denoiser has two engine options, the default V-Ray Denoiser and the NVIDIA AI Denoiser. The NVIDIA AI Denoiser is generally best for getting a fast interactive preview of your scene when using the IPR. It does not give consistent render results, however, so for final production renders and animations, we recommend using the default V-Ray Denoiser. Since we're doing a production render, let's leave it on that. Okay, now we can start a production render by pressing the Render button. And once it starts, you'll see how the buckets appear and begin rendering the image. All right, now that V-Ray finished rendering, I'm going to maximize the VFB so we can have a better view of the rendered image. Then, let's zoom in on the glass door, and to double check that the denoiser worked, we can toggle the RGB button here to switch between the default RGB image and the effects result. The effects result channel holds the result of the denoising operations and the lens effects that are executed over the image. You can see that the denoised image is a bit smoother looking overall, particularly in the glass and shaded areas. Now, since our image looks a bit too yellowish and flat for my taste, let's explore how we can apply some color corrections to it. If we click the button at the bottom left of the VFB, the V-Ray Color Correction Toolbar will appear on the right. Here you'll find parameters for further tweaking the image, such as exposure, white balance, curve adjustments, and more. Let's click to expand the exposure parameter and check the box to enable it, so that now its controls will affect the image. I'm going to adjust the exposure value, 
the highlight burn, which corrects the exposure of only the highlights in the image, and tweak the contrast a little bit. Next, I'm going to tweak the white balance parameter, which offers a slider with values in Kelvin temperature. Higher values will make the scene appear warmer, whereas lower values will make the scene bluer in tone. You can feel free to play with these settings on your own and adjust the image to your liking. When you're done, you can also save your current color correction settings for later use, or even load in a pre-existing color correction file by clicking on the Globals option up top. In this case, I'm going to load in a color correction file, which you'll find in the Assets folder for this lesson. And right away, you'll see how quickly the image changes as the new color corrections are applied. All right. Moving on with the VFB tools, we also have a history panel for saving and comparing images, which is marked by the H icon at the bottom of the VFB toolbar. First, click the power button icon to enable it and specify the directory where the image will be saved as VR image files. Then, we can save our image to the history with the color corrections applied by clicking on the disk icon at the top left. We could then even apply different color corrections to the image and save another version to the history following the same steps. I'm also just going to save the image as a standard JPEG file to my hard drive by clicking on the disk icon at the top center of the toolbar in the VFB. Note that you can choose from a variety of other image formats using this method as well. All right, now you've seen a quick overview of how to get started rendering and working with VRA Next for 3ds Max.